That's what I thought, but I just I didn't know how to Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. It's a pleasure to welcome you here uh, to the Bloomberg School of Public Health uh, and uh, to this, I think, very extraordinary conversation. I'm Bob Blum, and I am the director of the Urban Health Institute. And so it has been an extraordinary pleasure uh, for uh, me to have the opportunity uh, to get to know and to uh, work with uh, two amazing students who have worked tirelessly to put this program together. Uh, Linda Poon uh, is an undergraduate, uh, and uh, Kate Mealy is uh, a uh, medical student uh, who represent uh, the Center for Social Concern and Source, uh, respectively, and uh, have collaborated with our community partners, uh, Rebka Nafu uh, and uh, uh, Michael Scott and uh, others in organizing this symposium. Farah Qureshi has been uh, a key player, uh, as has been so many others. Uh, but the absolute credit goes to the two of you who have done this wonderful, wonderful job. So first of all, please join me in a round of applause. So this is the beginning of a set of conversations uh, with the community, with students, with faculty, uh, as part of the lead up to uh, the symposium on the social determinants of health that will be held uh, April 23rd. In your folder, there's a flyer uh, on that program. We are currently uh, extending invitations. We're going to be using some of the information that comes from the discussions today to uh, uh, flesh out the program. But over the next week or two, uh, we'll be extending invitations. Sir Michael Marmot, whose name you, some of you may know, is uh, really the godfather of uh, work in social determinants of health, will be giving a keynote. Uh, uh, Dr. Tony Eiten from the California Wellness uh, Foundation will uh, be giving a summary uh, presentation. We have a panel of philanthropy uh, presidents. Uh, Ron Daniels, the president of the university, will be uh, part of the symposium as will uh, the provost. Uh, uh, we have some fabulous and exciting components of uh, the, the program. We have engaged uh, uh, junior high students uh, from the East Baltimore area uh, who will be putting together, and we'll be editing, a video uh, on that we will open uh, the program with on community assets, and they will be uh, photographs. But the other thing that I want to draw to your attention uh, is uh, the poster part of that program. And there's a folder uh, in, uh, a, a flyer in your folder that speaks to that. So one of the uh, um, components that um, we want to highlight at the conference, and we will do it at the reception, is student community collaborations. And community can be with state or city offices. It can be with uh, community-based organizations. And we know that students are engaged both at the undergraduate and graduate level with a wide range of uh, both research and programs uh, grounded in the community. So we want to highlight it. We want to recognize it. So first, um, uh, we are going to facilitate this by uh, allocating $50 to uh, 20 uh, student individuals or small student groups uh, to help put together the program. Two is that at the meeting, at, uh, on uh, April uh, 23rd, we're going to give uh, a set of awards. Uh, uh, two for undergraduates, one in the research category and one in the program category. And we're going to give two awards for graduate, uh, 
graduate student community collaborations. We see these funds to be used to advance those collaborations. These are not personal awards, but they are awards to go toward the work that uh, you're being recognized for. So if you have a project, if you're working with a community organization, please, please uh, um, uh, let us know. You can go online and it tells you how in the flyer. Uh, so I would also mention in terms of the Social Determinants of Health Symposium, we have support uh, both from the provost office and from um, community entities and from the deans of medicine, nursing, public health, uh, and arts and sciences to help uh, underwrite the cost of uh, um, registration. The cost of registration, if you are a student, is $5. That is for early registration. Uh, and the website tells you how early early is, but it hasn't passed because the website just went live today. Second, uh, there's then a $10 charge if you're um, a little bit later, but before the conference. And I think on-site registration is over $1,000. So uh, may I make a suggestion? Register early. Uh, and uh, uh, the cost is um, $5, uh, which uh, ain't bad. Cheaper than a movie and uh, better stars. So uh, um, that's uh, uh, an overview. The final thing that I would just mention and draw to your attention is that it also as part of the uh, lead up uh, to uh, the Social Determinants of Health Conference and as part of uh, Black History Month this coming Saturday at 1 o'clock uh, here in Somer Auditorium. Uh, uh, the Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright from Chicago uh, will be speaking. There'll be a panel uh, that follows uh, uh, his uh, presentation. Because space is limited, uh, uh, we ask that you register in advance. And now, let me turn it over to Kate Mealy. So again, welcome. As Bob said, my name is Kate Mealy. I'm a second year medical student here. Um, and I just am going to take you through briefly what's going to happen today. I know that it's a little bit complicated. It certainly would have been easier for us to just keep you in this big room for the whole evening. Um, but out of respect to you and in recognition of all the work that everyone in this room is already doing in the area of social determinants of health, we wanted to have the opportunity to break up into smaller groups so that you would have a chance to share your experiences, your successes, and your challenges around working on these issues here in Baltimore. Um, so what we're going to do is start, obviously, with a brief welcome, because what else would you start with? Um, and then we're going to have um, Dr. Peter Bielinson, who is the former commissioner of health um, for Baltimore City and Howard County. Um, do a quick talk about his work and a Q&A session. Um, then we're going to watch a short four-minute social determinants of health video to contextualize everything that we're learning about today. Um, and then Sarah Morris Compton from the Baltimore City um, Department of Health is going to um, be pinch hitting for Dr. Barbo because of an unexpected death in the Baltimore City Health Department family um, earlier this week. Um, and then we're going to have a quick contextualization further of the discussions that you're going to be having in small groups, and then we're going to break out into those small groups. So your guide to get to the right room um, is all in your packet, and we're going to go through that. So don't stress. We'll get you to the right place. Um, but for now, just enjoy your time in this um, awesome space um, with our great speakers. Um, and we hope that you are able to get a lot out of it and to also contribute to the discussion that's going on here in Baltimore about how to work on these very challenging issues that we face every day. Um, so I'm going to uh, turn it over to my colleague, Linda Poon, uh, from Homewood Campus, and she's going to introduce our first real speaker. Hello, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Bielinson, who currently serves as the CEO of Evergreen Health Cooperative, a member-owned health care model. He previously served as the Baltimore City Health Commissioner and as, Howard, and as Howard County Health Officer. His vision led many to posit, has led many to positive health outcomes, including expanding drug treatment programs, preventing lead poisoning, and creating the Health Care for All initiate, initiative here in Maryland. And of course, I would be remiss if I failed to mention his very popular new book, Tapping into the Wire. 
Dr. Bielinson, it is our pleasure to welcome you to tonight's Baltimore Community Conversation on What Determines Health. Thank you, that makes my face look a little bit fatter. I don't have a PowerPoint, so you have to look at it, I guess. It's good to see a lot of people that I know, Nikki, where's Nikki? Um, Stephen Ragsdale and Dr. Blum and Joe Adams and Angelo Solera. Um, it's a pleasure to be back here. I actually used to be the TA here in Lee Bone. Chris, hello. Everybody knows me here, so I don't have to talk. Um, I was here as a, as a resident and then as um, a TA for a period of time, and I now TA at uh, Hopkins, I mean, I TA, I teach at Hopkins um, undergrad on a class called Baltimore and the Wire, which looks a lot at social determinants of health writ large. So I'm just going to talk briefly about um, the, the four-legged stool of a healthy community. How many of you came to the TEDx? Anybody? No. So you haven't heard me say this one before. Um, I haven't lectured as much at the School of Public Health this year, so hopefully you haven't heard this. So basically, this is not rocket science, as much of public health isn't. Um, it's really kind of common sense, but what I've come to the conclusion after 20 years, amazingly, of working in, um, in two, mostly in two jurisdictions um, is that place utterly matters, and I know you all know that, and I know that's what the community conversation is supposed to be about today, um, but nothing actually puts it in, in sharper, and there's Lori Zabin, my advisor 20 years ago, who looks exactly the same, although I look much older. Um, uh, is the, the, what put it in the starkest um, opposition is working in Baltimore City, the fifth poorest jurisdiction in the United States of America. And you know, for those of you who haven't been here that long, the city is its own county, effectively, to Howard County, the third wealthiest jurisdiction in median income in the United States of America, with 12 miles between my offices. And nothing has uh, demonstrates more, more significantly the importance of where a place matters. Honestly, my job in Howard County, although my boss, my former boss, Ken Ullman, is running for governor and I'm hugely supportive of him, was unbelievably easy um, because there just aren't that many issues in Howard County. Yes, there are vulnerable populations, no, no denying that, um, but the, the disparities are not anywhere near as significant and the fact that you have significant supports in a whole range of areas of people's lives makes a tremendous difference. So. What it led me to conclude is that there's basically a four-legged stool of, of healthy communities, and you need all four legs of that stool to be supported. Um, as obviously, if you had a four-legged stool and one of the legs was taken off, it would not be terribly stable, and if two legs were taken off, it would be completely unstable. So they are in no particular order, uh, access to healthy foods, health, healthy activities, and health care, number one. Number two, access to decent, safe housing in safe neighborhoods. That includes gun safety. Um, number three, access to decent, solid public education so people have a chance to learn what they need to learn to be successful in life. And fourth, and probably most important, is access to livable wage jobs, not minimum, but livable wage jobs in communities that are accessible to, people, to the adults of that community. And you need all four of them. Um, as an example, we started something called Healthy Howard in Howard County, which um, was sort of the predecessor to what I'm doing now. I'm the head of a um, nonprofit health cooperative for Maryland that was enabled by the Affordable Care Act, as some of us know. Um, and we did the pilot was Healthy Howard, which is basically providing health care to uninsured people who made more than Medicaid eligibility, but not enough to afford health care. Um, in the private sector, either because they weren't offered it at work or they, they couldn't afford it individually. And so we piloted that, and it was actually quite successful. And so a lot of folks would ask from Baltimore, why don't you just bring Healthy Howard to Baltimore? Why don't you do it in West Baltimore through Bon Secours or through Hopkins here in East Baltimore? Not that other things weren't going on, and because and that would solve the community's problem. And the answer is it wouldn't. It would provide decent health care, but you'd still have dilapidated housing. You'd still have cruddy public schools and you still have a tremendous dearth of livable wage jobs. So I don't have great solutions other than that we have to work towards all of these different aspects. And I know the Urban Health Institute does that, and I know Bob does that, and I know many others in you have been working to do that. But it means actually getting involved in the political world. And I know a lot of us in public health think uh, that the political world is somewhat dirty, and um, having to go after money is not uh, 
kosher is not the right word, um, although I'm Jewish so I can say that, is not, uh, not the fun thing to do, but unless you are willing to pursue funding and play in the political arena, we are not going to have successes. You can talk all you want about social determinants of health, but unless you start influencing policy, you're not going to make a difference. And so I'll leave you with um, this one point uh, before I take questions, and that is, the, how, so how could you influence policy? Um, a, you could run for office, as I have done, failing miserably three times, um, <laughs> although to the support of a lot of you. <laughs> um, so I would have won this room <clears throat> overwhelmingly. Um, but you can also get involved in the political process by advocating. And, the, and at the local level, that's really quite easy to do. And here's one simple example. How many of you know about the un unbelievably wasteful Grand Prix? If we spent, <clears throat> if the mayor and the city council spent one one hundredth of the time they spent on attracting that guaranteed money losing proposition to bringing livable wage jobs, supermarkets to, un, to, to food deserts um, without, which don't need tax incentives, by the way, um, we would be in a much, much better shape as a city and in terms of more equitable social determinants of health. So I would argue that you need to advocate. If you're not going to run for office, advocate at the local level at the very least, if not the state level. Federal level is so tied up in the partisanship and high-level stuff, it's almost not worth getting, in, getting into, rightly. Um, so that's, what, that's, uh, that's my message. Get involved and try and bring the social determinants of health, the disparities in the social determinants of health, down and try and work on all four legs of the stool at one time. I'm done. Questions? There's a question for you, right? Yeah. So we do have, if you guys can ask questions, you can either yell or use the mic if you'd like. Who's going to be the first to chime in? Was it really that? Well, it's a question of, of where you put your budgetary resources. Again, the Grand Prix is a good example, which we spent a huge amount of time and effort and financial resources on an effort that was guaranteed to cost money. It actually has been a money loser two years in a row, and the question is whether we'll, we are apparently going to do it again this year. Um, or do you put your resources and funding into um, tax incentives, for example, to bring in, um, working, working livable wage jobs into communities or if you have to provide a, a tax incentive to get supermarkets into, into the communities which provide livable wage jobs as well, I argue that it would be much better spent, much better time spent and resources spent by the politicians doing that. But in order to push them to do that, you've got to beat the business folks. I mean, the Grand Prix was brought here because the downtown business people really like it as a showcase for Baltimore and you have the shiny cars right, driving really fast through the city, et cetera. Um, but they didn't hear from the communities. I mean, I'm not saying that there's no community involvement. Don't get me wrong. I know a lot of you are involved in community activities. But Baltimore is just notoriously fragmented. We're a city of neighborhoods, which is good in some ways, but we're also a city of neighborhoods and little tribal groups and little communities, and they rarely come together. And I would argue that actually what Howard County does quite well, granted, it's a much easier place to work. Um, because there's, there's, there's smaller numbers of problems. But their communities, they have a group called the Association of Community Services, which are every one of uh, Betsy's and Lee's and Chris's and Stephen's groups all working together and uh, picking two or three issues a year to work on. Granted, it's easier there, but I would really hope that we'd have some more communal, communal um, collaborative community advocacy efforts rather than kind of community by community. I don't know if that's a great answer to your question, but it's something at least how we could approach some major issues citywide. As an example, perfect example, city, uh, the jail for juveniles. Anybody know about this issue? I'm not even asked where people stand, and, and I can tell you I, stay, I think it's outrageous that we're building a jail for juveniles because you're pr planning to have problems, pr planning to have problem kids that need some place to go instead of investing in the resources in them um, in a more uh, um, appropriate way and opportunity uh, agenda. But 
the 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 um, the actors that you would expect to act were so fragmented that the governor and the legislature was able to do pretty much what they wanted to do. Granted, the juvenile jail is not being built, but they didn't transfer that huge amount of money into opportunity activities for kids because it was too just fragment too fragmented a community of advocates. So I would argue again that we really need to come together as a city in, in our advocacy as well as, as our um, policies. Christopher. Peter, I, I agree with you, obviously you know that. I'm wondering if what you think about, so a long time these things are at odds with each other, sort of the business community and the public health community, but I'm beginning to think they don't have to be, actually, and they, they, can, they can both benefit each other around common issues and what's good for the community is good or can be good for the community, and, and, and that's, a, in my mind, I'm beginning to think a much more effective way of trying to, 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 to go down this road than continuing to blame each other and argue about why it's not important to be with each other. What do you right. think? Now, a couple of things, a couple of examples. One is like the Greater Baltimore Committee, which is sort of the big guy Chamber of Commerce, which is actually far more um, um, progressive than a lot of other sort of smaller business groups. And they are very supportive of, of large-scale efforts for example, working with them on, on implementing, uh, on, on doing a very good implementation of the Affordable Care Act is something I think that would benefit them. It benefits their companies, goes on tight. Um, and doing the same with smaller businesses who are gonna have a hard time understanding how to do the Affordable Care Act, doing that community by community. That's an example where community by community, folks like yourself and Stevens Group, et cetera, can, can go to the community and go to the businesses and explain to them how the Affordable Care Act benefits them in terms of reducing presenteeism and absenteeism as well as their employees. So I, I think there are definitely win-wins. It just has not been approached that way particularly. And to do that, you have to get involved in the political process. You've got to learn if you're going to stay in Baltimore, <clears throat> and most of you, I guarantee the younger ones in here, have no intention of staying in Baltimore. I had no intention of staying in Baltimore when Chris and I were residents in 1990, whatever, 1991 and 92. And we were going to be here for three years, and it's been 27 years, and I'm still here. So it, if you, many of you will end up staying here. And it's really important to get to know the, this is not a huge town. One of the benefits of being in Baltimore is it's kind of like a big, small town. And you can know tons of people that are movers and shakers in all different communities. I mean, I think if I lived, stayed in LA where I grew up, I would not know people like a lot of the people that I know here. Um, but you've got to get to know the people and that's how you can bring, bring um, strength of numbers to bear on issues. A couple more questions. What are your thoughts on um, distributing um, social supports, like say within the schools and making the schools kind of centers of the community, which would be accessible to people who need the support and would also be sort of a holistic embracing of the entire community? Mm -hmm. So that's a, a very um, apropos question because I just talked to Jeffrey Canada about an hour ago. One of the reasons I'm a little bit disjointed here is I raced down from Towson and I was running here and didn't realize that the doors were, the street was blocked off, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, Jeffrey Canada, who runs the Harlem Children's Zone, actually that's what they do in, in Harlem um, in, in large part, the Beacon schools. We tried to do this in Baltimore. Lori Zabin got contraceptives in school-based health centers back in 1984 or something like that, doing exactly that. Um, Angelo worked in the health department with me. We tried to do that extensively. The school system, Alonzo's pretty good about it, but I can't tell you how many superintendents, you know, is the dance of the lemons. Uh, in my 13 years as a health commissioner, I think we went through 11 school superintendents, and almost none of them were interested in having people come into their schools. They raise every issue in the world from paying for custodial care for the after hours to the one that came from Florida, Carmela. Carm oh my God, she was unbelievable. <laughs> she had me in her office screaming at me that no one will set foot in her schools. Um, and it's just outrageous. These are community um, benefits. 
it's ridiculous to, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir. I mean, it's ridiculous to have a building used for seven hours a day and be empty the rest of the time when we have all these resources in an area, oftentimes in vulnerable areas that don't have other such resources. I've coached 36 seasons of youth sports and I live in Baltimore City and not one of those teams has ever been from Baltimore City because there's so few recreation opportunities in Baltimore City. I coach out in Towson all the time in the schools. Every single one of the games is played in the school. So yes, we should be doing that. It's a long, long answer to a short question. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, nonviolence interventions and what type of things have we seen that are most effective in identifying the uh, perpetrators who are at risk and then the victims who are at risk? So, do I, just, do I know you? Um, med student, you probably had me. Uh, yeah, I've had you. It was, that was a softball question. Thank you. <laughs> so we started Operation Safe Kids. Do you know about Operation Safe Kids? So we started Operation Safe Kids to do exactly that. Um, and it's been quite successful. I actually haven't kept up with it for the last few years um, as much as I should, although we did put it in the book. And um, it basically, I, it was when Mayor O'Malley in, in 2002, when we had the most juvenile homicides of any city, not the highest rate, but the most juvenile homicides of any city in the country. Um, he had us do an analysis of who was getting shot. I think Phil, if Phil leaves in here, he's done research on this stuff too. Um, so basically identifying the next 32 kids who were before they got shot. And what we did was a combination of bringing as many resources to bear on them from decision makers. We had a project called KidStat, which every Tuesday at 10 a.m. we held sacrosanct. We went over every new kid into the program who was identified by juvenile services or the police and, and brought them emergency services, got them changed, uh, got their school location changed to get them away from people, places, and things, got grandma into drug treatment got multi-systemic family therapy for the family, et cetera, et cetera, while also having case managers hired from those neighborhoods. The best case manager we had actually was a, a woman who lost two kids to violence herself. Um, and, doing, and bringing those two things together reduced recidivism rate tremendously. There was at least one homicide of a, of a kid. It was actually the first kid, if any of you heard me talk before, it's the Corey story. Um, but as far as I know, there haven't been any others. And Operation Safe Streets, although it's had some problems, was, was a second block that was brought to bear on, on the issue. Not perfect, and it will never be perfect. And the lives that these kids leave are, lead are unbelievably chaotic. And for many of us, unless you visited them in their homes and seen their empty refrigerators and their bare walls and the jerry-rigged cord leading to the next um, house, row house, to bring food, uh, to bring electricity to their heater, uh, living with grandma who's a substance user and their half little brother and dad's in prison in South Carolina and mom's dead of AIDS due to drug use. Um, you know, they live unbelievably chaotic lives with 50% or so of kids in every elementary school ending up in a different elementary school every year or some numbers. It's a little bit lower now since alonzo has been here, but something like that. These are just chaos lives that these kids are living that many of us, some of us can, uh, you know, work with these folks. But otherwise, hey, Carol. Um, but otherwise, it's very difficult to um, expect perfection. So. This Operation Safe Kids, in answer to your question, was a life-saving program, but not as much a life-changing program as one would want because it got kids at 14, 15, 16, 17 rather than when they were younger, which is a, a goal we should be striving for. One more question? Um, sure. Actually, I think we have one more comment in the spirit of sharing and learning in the oh. moment from Dave Ahn, the leader of the Beautiful Temple, who's going to comment on the juvenile jail issue. Sure.
Uh, it's a very good question. I think I know what you're referring to in this case, but um, I mean, race is the biggest bugaboo issue we have. It's the most taboo issue. It's more than mental health. It's more than substance abuse. It's more than violence. It's something we rarely talk about. Actually, one of the things I most enjoyed about working with Mayor Smoke, who many of you were probably barely born when he was mayor, uh, was mayor from uh, 87 to 99, who I served with, who was, um, I greatly respect, is we'd spend a lot of time just, he was black, I'm, he is black, I'm white. Um, <laughs> is talking a lot about race issues and because a lot of things came up early on in my tenure as health commissioner that had a lot of um, racial tinges to them as Angela remembers. Um, so I think the first thing is just talking openly about it, which people just do not do. Um, and, and it's also talking openly about, well, the nonprofit industrial complex um, needs to be at more minority, well, as more majority, um, part, both participation and members on, <clears throat> excuse me, members on boards and all those sorts of things, but done quickly, not, well, we'll grow it slowly and we'll add one at black person to this board at a time. Um, so I don't know a simple answer other than we have, what you just did was important, bringing it up and being cognizant. I mean, like I'm very cognizant, having worked in Baltimore City for many years, of trying to have as diverse a group around me as possible at the appropriate level. I mean, it's one thing to say you have a bunch of African-American um, nurses assistants and all your assistant commissioners are white, which actually they were for a while until we diversified some. Um, but you've got to be willing to discuss it. I mean, that's, so I, I don't have a simple answer other than you've got to be able to talk about it. Great, I think we're just about done. Are you gonna comment on this issue? Yeah. Great, go uh, ahead, Linda uh, again. Nicely. You got a right check uh, uh, Dr. Billington, on, this, on, on the same note, can you talk in that same vein about economic investment? Um, as when it pertains to race and social determinants of health, one of the things that I find when we're doing this institutional work versus community work is there's a there's a difficult push for the long term sustain you know the sustainable investment. Um, we will opt to build the jail instead of building better schools and and and, uh, oh. and, and uh, programs at the lower level for the long term investment. So and, and that particular. Um, issue revolves a lot of times around race right. and what happens in community. Can you comment? So with, at the risk of supporting something that Safe and Sound does do, I think, well. Safe and Sound is a, is a group um, uh, that is, the board is a little bit more diverse. I'm actually the chairman of the board, as you may know, um, recently. I was actually the original founder of Safe and Sound. My three-year-old daughter at the time, who's now 25, named it Safe and Sound in a little crab fest. But anyway, um, so the thing that they do well, I think, actually, is not so much, and Hathaway will kill me for saying this, facilitating and convening, because I think there is some concern about who is doing the facilitating and convening, um, if it's just safe and sound alone. That, they certainly can be part of a larger coalition. Um, but the, the thing that they have done best is put together these things called compacts. They're government compacts, where you actually take the free market system and Republicans like this actually better than Democrats, amazingly enough. Ehrlich actually did this, where you pick invest programs where you invest in people. One that um, I was involved with was um, something recovery. Uh, anybody remember? Something. It was basically trying to keep kids of moms and dads who are substance abusers with the mom and dad, assuming it was safe for the kid, once the mom and dad were clean, instead of sending them out of state, costing a huge amount of money. Carol knows about this, right? So. The compact was with the state government who was paying enormous sums of money for people going out, for kids being placed out of state, that if this program worked, there'd be gain sharing. The program would keep getting money and the state, some of the savings, a percentage of the savings would go to the state government. And that made them invest in that. So I would argue that using the free market approach is the way to do that. And that, and you showing these things can be shown to have metrics that show when things are working or not working. And that's a way to continue to invest in, in projects. Thank you. Thanks. Great. So our next um, portion of the program is we are going to watch a video, which is always hard to do because this is double whammy. I think I'm going to ask our friends up in AV to come down and help me. So the screen got lost. Oh, maybe I got it. All right. There we go. 
there's one view of us as biological creatures that we are determined by our genes, that what we see in our biology is somehow innately us because of who we were born to be. What that misses is that we grow up and develop. We grow up as children, we grow up as adults and continue. We interact constantly with the world in which we are engaged. That's the way in which our biology actually happens. We carry our history in our bodies. How else could, how could we not? Living in America should be a ticket to good health. We have the highest gross national product in the world. I'm very happy to finally have some of my cars in one location, some of them. We spend $2 trillion per year on medical care. That's nearly half of all the health dollars spent in the world. But we've seen our statistics. We live shorter, often sicker lives than in any other industrialized country. We rank 30th in life expectancy. Especially of economically developed countries, we are at the bottom of the list. A higher percentage of our babies die in their first year of life than in Cuba, Slovenia, Estonia. How can this be? Is this just because 47 million of us have no health insurance? Healthcare can deal with the uh, diseases and illnesses, but a lack of healthcare is not the uh, cause of illness and disease. It is like saying, since uh, aspirin cures uh, a fever, that uh, lack of aspirin must be the cause of the fever. Or is it mostly because of our American diet and personal health behaviors? Those behaviors themselves are determined by economic status. And so our ability to avoid smoking and eat a healthy diet depends in turn on our access to income, education, and what we call the social determinants of health. But wouldn't our genes trump social determinants of health? Among twins who live together until age 18, who basically grew up in the same households, so had at least a relatively similar exposure. If they diverged later in life, if one became professional and the other was working class, they ended up with different health status as adults. This is among identical twins. Written into our bodies is a lifetime of experience, shaped by social conditions and policies that can determine who will be sicker, who will die sooner. There are ways in which our society is organized that are bad for our health. Uh, and there's no doubt that we could reconfigure ourselves in ways that would benefit our health. There are huge inequalities in the society. All this wealth is now distributed. Pet food, ice for the pets, water. And I think that's in part why the U.S. as a whole has relatively poor health amongst the rich countries and why even the better off people are suffering. And we think that that is not inevitable. Unnatural causes. Is inequality making us sick? Coming to PBS 2008. So that's just a video that we thought would help to contextualize everything that we were going to be talking about today. Um, those are the issues. Those are the reason that you guys are doing what you're doing and why you came to this event. I'm assuming was to help change these issues that we're talking about in this video. 
Um, so next up, we're going to have um, Sarah Morris Compton, who's going to be the final part of our program in Sheldon Hall, talk to us a little bit about what Baltimore City Health Department is already doing around these issues. Um, I think a lot of times we focus on the work that we as students or we as community groups are working on, but it's important to always remember to integrate ourselves within the work of the health department and other government agencies as well. So Sarah. Um, Sarah is the director of um, the Office of Planning and Policy uh, for the Baltimore City Health Department. She directs the day-to-day -day operations um, of the health policy agenda, which includes Healthy Baltimore 2015. Um, and she also has a wide range of work experiences. Um, she was a social worker in a former life, as well as a Peace Corps volunteer for two terms. And she also worked for the Annie Casey Foundation. So she has a wealth of experience, and it's our pleasure to welcome you, Thank you. today. You're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity, Bob and others. Thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit tonight about um, some of our experiences and the work underway at the City Health Department. I also need to say um, I'm here on behalf of Dr. Oxides Barbeau, our health commissioner. She was very much looking forward to having the opportunity to share our work with you tonight. And I appreciated the question earlier about strategies to reduce violence in particular. And that has a special relevance to us this week because um, the health department actually has um, lost one of our staff due to homicide in the last week. And um, Dr. Barbeau was unable to attend tonight because she's busy working with our staff and our HIV bureau and also um, planning um, to be sort of involved with services later on this week. So again, she sends her apologies that she's unable, unable to be here. But it's timely given that we're thinking about issues of community health and what are the factors that contribute to community health and certainly violence as a public health issue is one that we think about, not only in terms of our strategic work, but also um, as it relates to, for those of us who live in the city, this is part of, sometimes it hits a little closer to home in terms of affecting our personal, our families or our work families. So I, I wanted to mention that to you all. Um, I also wanted to give a really brief, a little bit of history about the Baltimore City Health Department. So the health department in Baltimore um, was founded in uh, 1793 and is actually, interestingly, the longest continually um, running health department in the United States. Uh, that's something um, as a policy professional that I found really interesting when joining the health department a year and a half ago. Uh, and over time, the health department's work has really shifted from focusing on a more traditional role, what was originally the focus of public health. So um, focusing on identifying immediate um, direct risks um, and, and um, harms to health um, and intervening in those. So thinking about smallpox eradication, most relevant in Baltimore in particular, fluoridation of water, uh, vaccinations, and then later motor vehicle safety. And um, the field has really shifted in, in over, over the years and recently has shifted um, with a, to a significant focus on the social determinants of health. Uh, that's been aided by incredibly strong and forward-thinking health commissioners um, over a number of years, including Dr. Bielinson, and wonderful to have an opportunity to hear him speak uh, tonight, as well as um, Dr. Sharfstein, who is uh, the head of uh, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene for Maryland um, presently. So Baltimore has enjoyed really progressive leaders over the years. And um, in that same spirit, Dr. Barbeau was appointed about two and a half years ago. And with her appointment came a real increased commitment on the, ba on the part of the city to really be a, a catalyst for policy development, and not just policy development in terms of traditional health policy, but thinking um, more broadly about health and human services and neighborhood conditions in the city, and what's the role of the health department in um, fostering a broader policy discussion beyond um, the health community to um, those agencies and stakeholders who deal more with the built and social environment in our communities. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit um, there's a lot underway, and I don't think there's time to discuss those comprehensively, but I'll give you a couple of examples of, of where that work is taking shape locally. And I was pleased that the, um, the discussion earlier ended with some thinking about policy and the importance of uh, increased focus on health policy, because we share that commitment and, and agree. Um, so to echo what's been said already, I think many of us in this room understand that when we think about health and we think about the health of our communities, um, that includes both the factors related to medical care, affordability, access, coverage, personal health behaviors, 
But really, particularly when we think about a place like Baltimore, we need to think about living and working conditions in homes and communities, about social and economic opportunities and resources. This includes and needs to include very intentionally a consideration of, of issues such as racial bias, um, income, education, social status, community resources, housing, many of the things that have been referenced already already tonight. Um, <coughs> and when we think in particular um, uh, about a city like Baltimore, which has world-class and tremendous health riches, um, it is unconscionable that we envision, we know that there's a 20-year gap in life expectancy between neighborhoods that are only a few miles apart from one another. And that's something that we take very seriously at the health department, along with other, um, as I'm sure you do. And, um, and it's something that uh, we've really used as a focal point for many of our, our efforts that are in development and underway right now. Uh, so many of you maybe have probably seen this map. Uh, I know many of the folks in the room are very familiar with this data. But this, this map, um, coming from our neighborhood health profiles released in December of 2011, um, show us what we, what we know, that there's a 20-year gap in life expectancy between neighborhoods that are really close to one another. So the neighborhoods in red um, reflect life expectancy in the low to mid 60s, 62 to 66. And in the bright green, it's 75 to 83 years of age. So you can see the disparities. But I think for us um, as a department, what's changed in recent years is not only are we looking at the disparity um, based on place, but also looking at what are the factors and communities that contribute to that beyond traditionally what we've looked at as a health department. And so this has led to looking at metrics like the concept of avertable death. Um, avertable death um, is calculated by looking at the five um, most affluent neighborhoods in Baltimore City and saying how many deaths in Baltimore City um, could be prevented if all residents had the same opportunities at good health. And we see um, in 25% of Baltimore's communities, over half of all deaths are avoidable. To put that a little bit differently, when we think about the social determinants of health, we know the top five causes of death are heart disease, cancer, homicide, HIV, and drug-induced death. Um, while all of these have components that are um, tied to the social determinants, certainly homicide, HIV, and drug-induced death are all um, causes of death that are clearly um, driven by social and economic factors. And so um, that's part of the rationale for our current health policy agenda in Baltimore City, Healthy Baltimore 2015. I think many of you may be familiar with that already from other talks. Um, I won't go into a great deal of detail here other than to mention um, it's our health policy agenda, not just for the health department, but for all, for all city agencies and, um, and broader stakeholders. It sets out very ambitious targets for where we think we can impact working collectively, um, preventable disease, disability, and death, um, particularly in the 10 areas, um, 10 priority areas that are the greatest um, causes or drivers of that preventable disease, disability, and death. And, and the strategy outlines uh, a three-prong approach policy promoting access to quality health care and maximizing community engagement. And I'll talk a little bit very briefly about um, some of the work underway in terms of policy and community engagement um, in particular, because that's something that's come up quite a bit this evening already. I, I think um, the other pieces I should mention, so of course the 10 priority areas, I won't read these, these are available online and on our website. One thing I'll just underscore in the development of Healthy Baltimore 2015 that I think is really important for um, folks to know is that assumed in this, we assume in um, implementation of this effort um, a really intentional focus on health disparities so that not only do we look at how can we raise the overall health um, improve the overall health outcomes in Baltimore City, but how do we close the gaps? How do we close that 20-year gap in life expectancy between neighborhoods? Um, we build in an assumption about the social determinants of health, so I hope um, you'll see and would welcome additional input about how we can more um, thoughtfully incorporate the acknowledgement that where we live, work, learn, and play really drives our health outcomes in really powerful ways. Um, and then also assumed in this agenda is a health in all policies approach. Uh, that it's not just the work of the health department, that we can't be successful in this work alone, and that we need partners, including many of the partners I see in this room, but we're always welcome and open to others. 
So I'll just go over a few examples of specific um, interventions underway because I understand that was um, part of the idea to give some fodder for later discussion. So a couple of policy interventions. Our cross-agency health task force um, was developed about a year and a half ago, convened by the mayor, and it's comprised of senior leaders from each city department. And the mayor convened um, those leaders and asked those leaders to take up um, consideration of, of health outcomes, particularly uh, the outcomes outlined in Healthy Baltimore 2015. Now, over time, that's really evolved to an increasing focus, not just on the um, initiative overall, but specifically, what's the role that each city department, including Department of Transportation, Planning, Public Works, um, and on and on, what role can they play in particular in promoting safe spaces for physical activity? Uh, there's a lot of effort underway um, that I, I don't think I'll have the opportunity to discuss tonight related to food access and really innovative strategies for food access. But we thought that the, um, uh, that the issue of physical activity hadn't sort of been sufficiently addressed um, and there hadn't been sufficient focus. So the work of the cross-agency health task force has been to identify what can be done across departments. And here are a few examples of where that's played out already. So um, looking with the Department of Transportation about walking school bus programs working with the police on issues of safety in communities because we know you can't have a credible conversation with residents and communities about physical activity unless it's a, com it's a community that's safe for people to be outside. Um, looking um, at our partners in the libraries at um, having programming in, in public library spaces, expanding outdoor physical activity programming in the public parks, and again, addressing the safety and facilities concerns that residents have surfaced um, so that access to those parks is, is a realistic, um, realistic goal. Uh, health impact assessment is another tool that um, has been used over the last year in, in the health department working with partners um, to advance a health and all policies approach. Um, through a, a grant from the Centers for Disease Control, um, the health department with partners is um, taking on nine health impact assessments over a three year period. And um, this is really a stepwise structured process for understanding the health impacts of non-health policies and plans. Now, as a policy professional, that's really interesting to me. But I think what I've heard from community over and over, that this is most interesting as it relates to specific projects. So specific projects that we looked at last year, for example, included evaluating the health impacts of the Vacants to Values program uh, in specific neighborhoods and particularly looking at um, the, the disparities in terms of outcomes related to birth outcomes and vacants to values. Uh, with um, our second HIA last year, we looked at the West Side uh, downtown redevelopment effort, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the work of Michael Scott from Equity Matters um, in, in that work uh, in community engagement. Um, so uh, from that HIA has come a set of recommendations about um, how can the West Side redevelopment effort um, in the area surrounding Lexington Market be done in a way that reduces negative health impacts and maximizes positive health in impacts for the surrounding community? And that incorporates thinking about some of the economic issues that have been discussed a little bit already tonight. And then finally, uh, last year we looked at liquor outlet density and the impact of liquor outlet density and violence. Um, the long-term goal of this is to really facilitate conversations of health impacts with non-health professionals uh, with the goal of really advancing um, consideration of health equity and helping city agencies to institutionalize that work. That requires a lot of culture change within um, city government, but I, um, I'm pleased to say that we're early in this work, but thus far we've um, um, had very open partners um, who have um, welcomed us to the table in shaping the recommendations for these policies and plans. So very briefly, I'll also just highlight community engagement because that came up earlier. Um, Healthy Baltimore 2015 was released. As I mentioned, that was followed by a December 2011 release of the neighborhood health profiles. If you haven't seen those profiles, I'd encourage you to look at them. Um, you can click on a map on our website, baltimorehealth.org, and it, can, um, it actually walks you through both health outcomes and the social determinants of health data for each of the 55 individual community statistical areas in Baltimore City. So if you want to know about a particular area or the area where you live, it outlines that information. Um, we use that data in an initiative that began last year to start conversations with community about health outcomes and the social determinants of health. Uh, and that process, um, although much more involved than I have time to mention here, really involved walking, walking through the data with community uh, representatives 
working through the neighborhood associations, through community-based organizations, through faith organizations, through many of the individuals actually I see in this room um, to get folk from um, the community to tell us, does the data make sense? How does this data mesh with your experience? Uh, what are the, the most significant health issues that you see? Um, that leading to um, ongoing conversations about what can we do together? Because I said, as I said, we know that this isn't an effort the health department can drive alone. Um, we have worked over the last year and will continue to work to develop partnerships with residents. And we have a few um, community-based projects at this point, I'm proud to say, that are really being driven by neighborhood groups and um, um, have developed out of those prioritization discussions, thinking about of the health indicators that we just have gone through that are outlined in the health profiles, what are the things that are actually most relevant to the community? Um, so I hope that you'll offer me an opportunity um, some other time to share a little bit more about how that work is taking shape in individual neighborhoods around the city. Um, and I'll just, with, with that, I think um, so many different efforts underway. A couple I should mention because I think a, a number of you in the room are actually um, involved with these. So um, an issue that um, the health department's been actively involved in that certainly is a health and all policies effort is looking at zoning and um, how can we, through zoning, reduce the density of liquor outlets in the city. So that's an effort that's um, certainly taking up a lot of uh, my time and Dr. Barbo's time, as well as um, time from city leaders and, um, and really championing the public health argument for why we need to create sort of neighborhoods that um, are more supportive of, of health by both encouraging positive things and encouraging efforts to um, increase food access and so forth, but also reducing environmental risks such as the violence that we know occurs um, in the vicinity of, of a number of liquor stores in, in the city. So that's something that we're um, very involved with, which again, I'd be happy to talk with um, any of you about further if you're interested in that. And I'll just close by um, um, sharing something that Dr. Barbeau has built in and really um, assumed must be part of all of our work in the health department moving forward is um, just an awareness that healthy neighborhoods are created when we are intentional about the ways we think about policy and create policy that rights injustices and and institutionalizing that is certainly a challenge but it's something that we're, we're committed to and we welcome additional partners um, to help us be successful in that so thank you couple of questions. Um, would anyone like to start us off? Let's see. Questions? Uh, I knew it would happen eventually. I can talk. Okay. Um, so I think that's really an interesting idea about limiting the liquor stores in certain zones. And I'm wondering if there's any evidence behind that decreasing violence. <coughs> I'm so glad you asked that question. It's something that's come up a lot in the last six months, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we are confident in the evidence to support the policy. I'd encourage you to look. Um, most recently, a policy brief was released by the ABLE Foundation. Um, so if you look on the ABLE Foundation's website, they actually supported a group of scholars, um, many of which are affiliated with um, Johns Hopkins University, who um, wrote a really um, helpful sort of brief policy assessment, looking at this issue, looking at the literature, and um, it's, it's really posing this question, will reduction of density have an impact on violence? And we feel confident that it's, that it's strong policy. Um, I have a question in general and also specifically for the, can you hear me? I can. For thanks. the liquor issue. Um, so there will always be people who have different motivations than, than yours and the Department of Health and overall health of the residents of the city. Um, and so I guess one of the ways you try to do that is to try to um, get them to invest in it somehow to, to change that motivation, but it aligns with yours. And how do you do that with the people, uh, as far as the liquor density uh, issue is concerned, the liquor store owners, the ones who are profiting and who, who have a gain to keep those the way they are? That's a great question. Thanks. I think part of, part of what um, the city team has attempted to do, and actually um, I was in meetings today working with um, partners in 
Baltimore Development Corporation actually to think about this further and move this work further, is that we have to have a, um, a reasonable package of supports um, that would encourage, for example, the business owners who um, are motivated to continue their business and have successful businesses. We need to have a sort of credible and um, thorough package of supports for those businesses so that they would um, hopefully opt to stay in the community, see that it can be profitable to offer services and goods that are more promoting of health. Um, for example, laundromats, um, dry cleaners, groceries, um, converting, for example, if they want to be, become a corner store, why not consider um, selling a few healthy items and helping in addition to meeting a community need for which there is a market uh, that would also be promoting a, of community health. So I think that's where the conversation starts for us. Um, with that said, um, it's not an easy conversation to have. Um, as Dr. Bielinson mentioned earlier, uh, it's difficult to do this work without engaging in the political process. So I think understanding that there'll be tension there as we go through these changes, um, we need to sort of accept those as, as um, that's to be expected. Um, but we have and will continue to invite the business community to help us think about what are the business needs in communities that can actually be more promoting of health. We have two last questions, so we'll go to the front and then the last Hi. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak to um, those community conversations that you guys went around and had, and if as you presented that data to people, there was anything that changed your thinking in terms of the way you would approach different projects, or if they had ideas that were just surprising that really wound up kind of validating the idea of going around and having those conversations. Um, surprising, absolutely. Um, um, I learned, I've lived in Baltimore for a short period of time, about eight years, and I'll tell you I learned more in that six months than I'd, I'd learned from eight years of, of living in the city in various neighborhoods. Um, so a few things that come to mind, um, I think what we learn varies dramatically by neighborhoods. As was said earlier, we're a city of neighborhoods, and so community interest and need is completely, you know, there's a lot of variety um, where, depending on where you are in the city. I'll say a couple of things that um, that struck me. There were a few neighborhoods where residents said, um, Dr. Barbo, this is really um, helpful information. Um, it's really um, troubling information, but candidly, you're telling us things that we already know. So help us figure out what we're gonna do about it. Um, so that's, I think that was the response from a number from a number of communities. And that then created a lot of a great opportunity to say, great, Let's talk more about what we'll work on together. Um, so I think that's um, that's one thing that I really took away from the neighborhood health work, a, sort of a greater commitment to um, building new partnerships with community, which is not always easy, but we're committed to making it happen. So we're gonna go here, and then you can do our final question in the interest of going full circle since we did it last time. So when we talk about communities, we talk about neighborhoods, we talk about uh, race, but we don't talk about culture. We don't talk about the different cultures that are rising in Baltimore. Baltimore is changing, this nation is changing, and we are becoming a nation of, of diverse cultures. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, absolutely, thank you, Angelo. Um, I, I think what comes to mind for me in particular is um, how we've tried to move the conversation um, toward um, a focus not just on race, not just on place, right? But sort of ele like elevating the conversation so that it's one that's it's inclusive, acknowledges the impact of race, acknowledges place in in affecting social um, determinants as well and affecting health disparities. But we have to include consideration of, of um, culture. And I think what comes to mind for me is um, conversations we began. Um, uh, with Latino Provider Network and others about using sort of our EPI services department to do specific reports that look at the health outcomes of subpopulations within the city and using that um, at least to have a better understanding of what are some of the issues or um, citywide. I think um, as, as we have discussed before, I think that actually in some ways opens more questions than answers about what are the solutions and the strategies that make the most sense. Um, but we've really um, tried to move in the direction of at least asking the right questions and having those discussions so that we can co-create solutions with various groups that are interested in working with us. Hi. 
Um, I appreciate these reports. These are, I've been looking at them since 2009, and they're loaded with great information. My question to you is, how have the uh, delivery system mechanisms in Baltimore uh, embraced this data, this information? Have they embraced it, and if, if so, in what ways? Are you referring to healthcare systems locally? Yes. Um, so that's another great, great question and a moving, moving target. So, um, uh, in the sense that healthcare reform, the Affordable Care Act, has offered a number of opportunities to bring partners to the table that might have um, been less likely to do so previously. Um, not only in terms of thinking about healthcare system and healthcare delivery of healthcare services, but also um, uh, I should mention that. Uh, nonprofit hospitals have new requirements in terms of how they're expected both to identify community needs and report on those needs um, as required by new um, IRS um, um, sort of reporting requirements for community benefit. Um, that, that opportunity, that policy opportunity, has um, created a number of um, a chance for the health department to really act as convener. So we've convened the, the 12 large city hospitals a number of times and started conversations about how are you incorporating consideration uh, of health equity in your community health needs assessment. Uh, where there's openness, we've been able um, to work with the hospitals to shape how they're doing their health, community health needs assessment. And um, we're in the process with a couple of hospitals locally really piloting an approach where as they identify and report to the IRS about what they're doing to address not just um, clinical health care, but broader population health care and the footprint footprint around their campuses. We're sort of co-creating those projects. So a few of our neighborhood health initiative projects uh, will end up being sort of the community benefit project for the hospital in that geographic area. Again, this is all work that's sort of underway at present, but I'm, I'm hopeful that in a few years we'll be able to tell some real success stories of how that's taken shape in Baltimore. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you. for the last two minutes of the program, I'm going to have my two kind of co-conspirators um, in this event come up and talk to us a little bit about what's going to be happening in our small groups. Um, these are two individuals that this night would not have happened without and that a lot of really excellent work around social determinants in Baltimore would not have happened without them. So I have Reb Katnafu from the After School Institute and Michael Scott from Equity Matters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I'm going to start with Michael. And Michael, I'm going to look at you and say, I know you have stories to tell after stories after stories after stories of SDH, social determinants of health. So I'm going to make sure that you have take only one minute to be really concise and share whatever you want to say, because we need to move forward and let people eat and go to the workshop. So Agreed. I'll turn it over Agreed. to you. So, so yeah, we, we, should, we should do that. I'm hungry, too. Um, everyone's seen the real world. It's time to get real, right? Um, this, this work that we do is really about the matrix. Um, if you're a funder, it's about asking the questions that were asked earlier. If you're from the medical model, it's about understanding that green box. It's really about taking off the lens that you assume that the world looks like and be willing to listen to data and evidence, because the data and evidence is there. It's compelling, and it's worldwide. Um, but this work, as has been mentioned earlier, is really challenging because it's rife with uh, a lot of tensions that start with individuals that do the work because we have a certain way of framing and understanding the world. This work is about breaking through that. It's about listening, someone mentioned earlier, to community voice. And what we've learned around the country is that the wisdom is in communities. And if you frame it right and if you tee it up right, those solutions are the most sustainable and the most wise that you find. But you kind of do that in a very careful and constructive way, and that's not easy. So we hope that these breakout sessions will allow us to get into some of those deep dives, um, and, and, and you can join us to ask some different and difficult questions that we can further examine in the April conference. So this is the beginning. So you want to say a little bit about this? Upstream and downstream? Sure. Um, and then we move. So we talk about upstream and downstream. Um, and if you do this work, you're in the compassion fields. And as the way it was taught to me, they said, you know, if you see these people drowning in the water, you're pulling them out. And you're spending all your time pulling these people out of the water that are drowning. If you get a little better at that, you, you start to try to teach them to swim, right, a little further upstream. But this work that we do really asks a different question. 
it asks, why is this particular subgroup consistently swept in the water at the rates that it is? And to find the answer to that, you have to go all the way upstream. And you're swimming against a current that's pushing you down. And when you get up there, there's no easy answers, and there's a lot of difficult conversations, some of which we've heard tonight. It's about racism, classism, uh, some of the culture issues, how that plays out in funding, how that plays out in who gets to be the expert, because who gets to be the expert is the one that gets funded. Who gets to make decisions, and who gets to convene, right? These are the tough questions that no one likes to talk about, but this the data is very clear is what causes health. It's about stress and power. How does power create stress that's chronic, that creates chronic disease? So it's about the relationship between power and health. Have fun. So it's about swimming upstream. Okay, thank you so much for being so concise. So uh, we're going to be going to our small group, and that's where you're actually going to be eating. Um, so there are five four groups. Uh, if you look in your packet, there is economics, there's education, and where it says providers, is healthcare providers, health services, housing, race, racism, youth, and activism, okay? So you're gonna choose which breakout you're gonna be going to. You have students that will uh, escort you to the right room based on your interest. So what's gonna happen in this breakout rooms? So you're gonna have your dinner, and then you're gonna have a brief introduction by the co-facilitators, and then they're gonna share some of their experiences specific to that topic area of social determinants of health. Um, we'll show you a brief video, um, and then we conclude with the evaluation. But before we conclude, there's gonna be three, uh, about three questions that you're gonna be discussing in your breakout uh, group. One is what are the challenges relevant to that social determinants of health topic area? Uh, challenges and opportunities. Uh, what are promising practices? What are research questions you wanna propose for us to think about and discuss and come up with answer possibly April 23rd at the symposium? What are priorities for this work that you want to propose? So we take that into consideration as we plan the April 23rd symposium. We're going to have uh, Hopkins uh, students at each uh, breakout room taking notes. So we're documenting all the information and capturing that. Um, so all the information that is shared is really going to help us plan for the April 23rd symposium. So this is not an end. This is really the beginning to continue to plan for the April 23rd symposium. Um, I want to thank our student engagement uh, committee, Kate, and, and everybody else. So let's hear it for them again for this wonderful symposium. And I um, in, in, encourage you to get very active, very engaged in the conversation. But beyond this, you will find in your, in your packet opportunity, a, a postcard to indicate how do you want to continue to be engaged in this conversation? How do you want to work? Each of these work groups, I want to say, is co-facilitated by a Hopkins faculty or student and a community practitioner because we want to facilitate the process of research informing practice, practice informing research, um, students learning from practice and also from research. And moving forward April 10, 23rd, we're going to use a similar system uh, um, of learning from, from each other. So thank you very much. Any, any last words, Kate? Um, I'll just say quickly, so I know that the rooms in this building are incredibly confusing, but the, I'll give you two quick tips. So one, the west building is over here, so if you have a W in front of your room, you're going to go over on this side more, and the east building is over on this side. The only caveat is that the ele this elevator doesn't go to the ninth floor, so you actually have to use the elevator that's all the way around the back, so you have to follow all of your peers to the west side to take the elevator up to the ninth floor and I won't I won't take any complaints I did not design the building um, so that way you guys should be able to figure it out so basically everyone's basically going to be heading up the same stairwell to get to your place or taking the elevator in the back so thank you so much and we hope you guys have a great dinner and great conversation